This is part two of three on chapter five, looking at eukaryotic cells and eukaryotic microorganisms. In the previous part of this chapter, you looked at the different parts of the eukaryotic cell. In the next two parts of the chapter, we're actually gonna get into the microorganisms. So we're going to look at four different types of microorganisms that have eukaryotic cells. So here are the four different eukaryotic microbes we're going to look at. This part is going to focus on the fungi kingdom. The third part we're going to look at the algae and the protozoans. So those are in the protus kingdom. And then finally we're going to look at the parasitic worms or the helminths which are in the animal kingdom. So we're going to start off with the fungi kingdom. There's about a thousand 100,000 different species of fungi. They're divided into two different groups. So we're going to be looking at the macroscopic fungi. So macro means big. So these include things that we can see with our eyes pretty well. So mushrooms, um, puffballs, the gill fungi. So these are like the toadstools or mushrooms you can get at the grocery store. The other type of fungi are the microscopic fungi. So micro is little. So these include things that we need a microscope in order to see. These include the molds and also yeast. So the majority of fungi, they're either unicellular organisms, so they're just one cell, or they're colonial, so you have cells working together. Some of the fungi, they can have cellular specialization, so they can have certain cells that are responsible for reproduction, for example. So our microscopic fungi, they exist in two morphologies, so we have the yeast, which are round, ovid shape cells, and they reproduce asexually by budding. So this is just yeast, normal, um, like baker's yeast, you find in this yeast morphology. The other morphology is the hyphae. These are really long cells that are hooked together. So we see this in fungi that are in the ground or the molds have this morphology. Some species of fungi, they can exist in both forms, so either form, they're called dimorphic. And these are really characteristic of a lot of our pathogenic molds that cause disease. So in certain environments, they're going to have the yeast shape to them, which is shown on the left picture. So there are these round yeast cells. And then in other environments, they take on the hyphae form, which is shown on the right-hand side picture. So they have the really long um, filamentous cells that line up in a line. The fungi, nutritionally, they are heterotrophic. And this means that they have to eat or digest organic substances or other organisms in order to get their nutrients so they cannot make their own food. The majority of fungi are harmless saprobes. That means that they secrete digestive enzymes that break down the food, and then they absorb that food after it's broken down. So that's what a saprobe is. Other fungi are parasites, so they have to, um, they live on tissues of other organisms. They get their food from these organisms, but none of these parasites are obligate, so they don't have to be on living tissue in order to survive, but a lot of them prefer it. And specifically, a mycosis is a fungal infection, and you can see that down at the, the bottom picture here. So this person has a fungal infection. It looks like athlete's foot on their foot. So athlete's foot is a type of fungal infection shown in the picture. So this fungal organization, the yeast form, they have a soft uniform texture and appearance, and yeast, they reproduce asexually by a process called budding. So as you can see, we have a yeast cell, and it has a nucleus in it, it has different organelles, so we know it's a eukaryotic cell that creates this organism. And budding is basically they um, reproduce all of their chromosomes, so they have two cap copies of all their chromosomes, they split up their organelles, and they put it into another cell called a bud. And this bud, it grows over time, and then eventually it's going to break off 
or they can um, stay attached to each other and you get something called a pseudo hyphae. So it's not quite a hyphae because each one is an individual organism and they're kind of attached to each other so pseudo means fake, it's a fake hyphae looking structure. But you can still see that the cells are round, they're not a filament or long structure. So in the hyphae structure, so the filamentous fungi, they have a mass of hyphae. So if you have lots of these hyphae together, it's called a micellum, and that creates the body of the fungi. Some hyphae are divided by cross walls called septae. And other hyphae are not separated, so they can actually have more than one nuclei in this really long, big cell. And the hyphae, they can specialize into certain um, functions. So you can have vegetative hyphae. These are ones that digest, absorb nutrients. And then other hyphae or other cells are reproductive hyphae, where they can sexually reproduce. They produce spores for reproduction. So these different hyphae, you can have specialization of cells. So fungal reproduction, fungi can reproduce asexually, so you can have spores are formed through budding or mitosis, basically you just create more cells like the original parental cell. And there's two different structures that can form by asexual reproduction. You can have the condidia or the sporangiospores. So here are those two types of asexual reproduction methods, and both of them you end up with spores being formed. But on the left hand side we have the sporangiospores. This just means that the spores are produced inside of a sac, and you can see that in the top sporangiospore. So the little circles are spores, and then they're inside of a sac up here. The condidia. These are spores that are produced that are not held inside of a sac. They can kind of break off one by one. The sporangiospore is usually the sac burst open, all the spores are released at once. And then you can see the condidia, you can release spores one at a time. And there's different types of condidia. We're not going to go specifically into the different types, but just know that spores can be released, they're not held inside of a sac. Besides asexual reproduction, you can also have sexual reproduction. This is where the spores are formed following the fusion of two different strains of fungi. And this leads to the formation of some type of sexual structure. And we're going to look at zygospores, ascospores, and basidiospores for those different sexual structures. These sexual structures are the basis for how we classify fungi into the different groups. So here is a zygospore. So a lot of fungi, instead of having like male and female, you can have a positive strain and a negative strain. So those are the genders that you can have in fungi. So on a piece of bread, we have a positive strain fungi and we also have a negative strain fungi. So they will find each other. Those two strains, their cells are gonna fuse together at a certain spot. That fused cell is called a zygospore. So here if you go up towards the top of the circle you have two cells fused together form a zygote and then out of that zygote you get a zygospore and it's going to grow the sexually reproducing structure and then it's going to release spores from that structure. So this is a zygospore you have one cell that's fused together and it produces the zygospore that releases spores. The ascospore is a little bit different. So again, you're still going to have your positive hyphae and negative hyphae down at the bottom. So we have purple and blue. So the purple and blue, they're going to have cells that fuse together and you get the light blue hyphae up here. So in an ascospore, they're also called a cup fungi because it's going to produce this cup um, fruiting body or sexually reproducing structure. And this fruiting body, this cup that's produced, it's composed of positive hyphae, so you can see purple hyphae 
help give it structure. You have the negative hyphae, the dark blue giving structure. And then out of the cells that fuse together, you have your light blue hyphae that's making up the cup fungus as well. That light blue hyphae at the very end, it's going to produce ascospores, and they produce the spores. So ascospores, you have your two strains, and then the fusion cells all creating this ascospore structure. And then the last type of sexual reproduction is a basidiospore. This is where you get a mushroom that's formed. So again, you have your positive and negative um, strains. They fuse together, and then out of that fused cell, you're going to have your mushroom or toadstool that's produced. And then in that mushroom or toadstool, toadstool underneath you have gills that's where the spores are produced and they're released so basidiospore is any type of mushroom that's formed and like I said these sexually reproducing structures are what we use for fungal classification so in the kingdom the fungi kingdom is divided into several phyla and we're gonna look at five of them based on the type of sexual reproduction. So the phylum zygomycota produces zygospores, so that's the sexually reproducing. And then asexually, they mostly produce sporangiospores, so that structure that is, um, the spores are enclosed in a sac, although some species do produce the condidia over here. The second phylum, the phylum ascomycota, it sexually reproduces and produces ascospores, and then asexual reproduction, they all produce condidia. The third phylum, phylum basidiomycota, they produce basidiospores. And again, those are the mushrooms or the toadstool structures. And then asexually, they produce condidia. The phylum citromycota, they produce flagellated spores. So the other three groups, the spores don't have flagella on them, they can't move. They're usually spread using wind. But the flagellated spores, that allows these spores to swim through water. So a lot of the citromycota or the chytrids, they're found in aqueous environments where we have water. Then our fifth phylum are fungi that only produce asexual spores. So they don't reproduce sexually or we just haven't observed them reproducing sexually. So they're called imperfect fungi because they don't have sexual reproduction. So in our fungi, there's lots of diversity of fungi. So we have our um, macroscopic fungi. Those include the mushrooms, so things that we see. And then you also have the microscopic fungi, like the yeast and the molds. For fungal identification, we probably won't do this in lab. We'll see if we have time, but for Identification of a fungal infection, there's a specific media called DTM, and that st stands for Dermatophyte Testing Media. So if you have a person or an animal where you think they have a fungal infection, you'll collect a sample from them, and then you'll put it onto this DTM. And the DTM, it takes about a week for the fungus to grow on it, so it is um, kind of a long time to see if it's a fungal infection. So a lot of times you can tell if it's a fungal infection just by looking at the person or the animal, and you don't necessarily have to grow it. But if you do grow your fungus on the DTM, then you can look at macroscopic and microscopic observations to help identify it. So you're going to look for asexual spores. So what types of asexual spores are formed if it's the sporangiospores or the condidia? Um, you're going to look for the spores, the shape of them. You'll look at the hyphal type, and then you can also use macroscopic things like colony texture, the pigmentation, so the color of the colonies. Um, you can go even deeper looking at physiological characteristics or biochemical reactions. And then you can also do genetic makeup, so you can run PCR, do electrophoresis to help identify your species based on the DNA or the genes it has. So roles of fungi in the environment. So some fungi have adverse impacts. We've looked at mycosis 
These are fungal infections on humans and animals. Other fungi cause allergies, so if you're allergic to mold, that's an example of allergies for the fungi. Some fungi produce toxins that will cause us to feel sick. Um, other fungi, they can destroy crops or food storages. So we have an ear of corn that has a fungal infection shown on this slide. Besides the adverse impacts, some fungi species are beneficial, so they help decompose dead plants and animals, they help recycle nutrients in the environment. Fungi are sources of a lot of our antibiotics. Penicillin is a good example of this. It comes from the fungi penicillium. Yeast produces alcohol. Yeast, again, is in the fungi kingdom. You can have the production of different organic acids and also vitamins by these different fungi. Other fungi, they're used in making food. And we also use them a lot in genetic studies because fungi and yeast are really easy to grow in lab and they're eukaryotic organisms so we can study the genetics of eukaryotic organisms and then um, apply this to human cells or other eukaryotic organisms. And then this table 5.3 in your book, it lists the major fungal infections in humans, so different mycosis that you can have. So there's superficial infections. These are infections that are on the outer part of the skin or just um, in the skin layers or in the hair, the dermis part. So tinea is really common. So tinea or ringworm, this includes athlete's foot and ringworm. That's growing on the skin or just under the epidermis of the skin. In the mucous membranes, you can have Canada albicans. This causes yeast infections. Then you can also have systemic infections. So if the fungal spores get into the lungs or they get into deeper parts of the skin, you can have a lot of problems. So there's different um, systemic fungal infections listed on this table as well.